my intent today is even though you think you know me, some of you, some of you don't know me at all. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I'm going to introduce myself to you through my images. I am going to share what I love, what makes me smile, what makes me giggle, what makes me tick, what what feels like my why and why I photograph at all. Now, why is that important? Why should you care about me? You may or may not. My point is, I'm going to share me because I know me. <laughs> I don't know you, but I'm sharing a way of thinking that can take your images to the next level and will take your images to the next level. That when you show up fully, uh, when we all show up fully to whatever we're doing and bring that special light, that special spark of divine fire to the work that we do, it changes it and it elevates the work, it elevates people around us, and it helps people see us, understand us, connect with us in a way that just being technically perfect will never do. So I just want to make sure I had a, yeah, so here we go. I had a couple notes here on the screen I'm going to pull down because now on with the show. So let me pull up. I'm going to take a minute. It always takes me a second here. So mull over what I just said because yeah, I lose my, hold on a second. I will get it back. <laughs> there it is. All right. I have to share my screen first. Share. Here we go. All right. Oops. This is this. <laughs> this is real. This is real time, real life. Here we go. Boom. I'm assuming now somebody just confirmed, please, that you can see my screen. This is actually the very end. Yes, you can see. You can see it. You can see it. That's me. You wanted to know where to reach me. That's where to reach me. And I made a bit, <laughs> I made a huge mistake in that I went, see, now you're going to get it all in reverse. Isn't this special? <laughs> I love it when this happens. This is just free. Like you said, this is real life. I know it's real life. And I don't know why it went. Oh, here it is. Here's the scroll bar. Sorry, guys. After this great, there we go. Now I'm going to start full screen. Right. So I'm a. Fujifilm X photographer, not necessarily a Zoom expert. <laughs> and um, so here we are. And today I call this traveling landscapes because what I'm, what I'm talking about here, traveling landscapes, there's going to be some travel images and I've got some landscape images, but I'm calling it a journey with Karen Hutton because this is how I want you to think about your photography. I mean, think about it however you want to. I can't make you do anything. But when you think about a journey and writing your own book and sharing a unique perspective about what you love and what makes you tick and, you know, you know how there's things about you and what you want to convey that sometimes words just can't do it. We can do it with our photography. And the brilliant thing about photography is our medium is light and time. Now, one of the things that they discovered I'm going to talk about GFX, but one of the things they discovered about light is in quantum physics, they did a lot of experiments way back when, and they did it with particle streams. I used to live near one of them, big, huge, two mile long particle stream accel uh, accelerator. One of the things they determined about these uh, particle streams, it, thinking that as they did these experiments, that it would be a um, consistent, predictable result. What they determined about these particle stream experiments is they were completely affected by who was watching, specifically their thoughts, their feelings, their expectations, and all the personal stuff completely affected the, the particle streams of light. Now, imagine, like that's pretty interesting, and you can look that up, but imagine that now we have a little tiny particle stream accelerator in our hands called a camera. And we use light in that way and time. 
So this is why I'm constantly talking about, you know, and finding your artistic voice, finding your signature voice. It really is about what you love and what you want to say and really showing up fully for it because we are, we are working with quantum art in this way, light and time. So depending on the instrument you choose to paint with, you get different kinds of results. So I'm going to switch over to the talk about gear and why I choose GFX generally for my personal work. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about here in two parts. Part one, I'm going to answer a few questions. I get a lot of them. So here's a few, and it's about the gear itself. Um, you know, GFX versus X series. Mostly it's the difference between um, sensor size for me and, you know, the properties that each of those things bring. With Fujifilm generally, it, it's for me, it's about like in painting the picture that I want. It, in my mind, there, in my vision, there's a certain... Uh, color sensibility, tonal range, dynamic range, clarity, there's a feel, there's a vibe, there's a, there's a thing. And when I first saw a Fujifilm image, you know, it was like, well, there it is. I, I don't have to work so hard to create it and bend another set of pixels to my will because there it is. So that went into my choice for Fujifilm, GFX versus X series. I'll, I'll talk a little more about it, but mainly it's the sensor size and, and what each of, you know, what the large format sensors mean and what, what that does in terms of vision and expression and, and getting your point across. Large prints. So I'd make large prints. I do, um, part, of, part of my business is installations for, for, you know, homes as well as businesses and they're big. So they're like, you know, five and six feet across. They're not 12 feet across, but they're big. And, but I could go 12 feet across, but consistently I do about five to six feet on the long side of these images, um, you know, often on metal. So, you know, it's gotta be a pretty good, uh, pretty darn good resolution. And the big prints is, it's just so much easier. It isn't that you can't do it with a smaller sensor. It's just sort of natively, naturally, GFXs are built for big prints. And that's part of what I do. Um, portability. So, you know, if you really, really, really need a light camera, then you choose a smaller camera, the GFX, they're getting lighter. And like my GFX 100S is super easy to carry around. It's totally portable. And every time I look through it, I'm like, this is large format. I can't even believe it is. Um, I need speed. Um, and these have gotten faster, you, you know, when, when they all started, it was just a little bit slow, but it didn't matter because personal work and it's art and I take my time, but now I'm starting to be able to capture, you know, birds in flight and so on and so forth with no problem whatsoever. It's amazing. Um, considerations. Some of the questions are computing power. So if you're choosing between say a hundred S, uh, you know, uh, the hundred, the GFX 100, whatever designation and the GFX 50 and you and you have a lower computer computing power computer you might want to stick with the 50s i never have problems even on my older laptops um, doing my editing with the 50s images i do have to use my stronger computer for the 100s i'll just be honest um, you know like i said is it portable is it fast enough is it all these things for me and for what i do you have to always consider it is all those things do i really need a gfx I don't know if you really need a GFX. I do, and I'll be talking more about why, even though I'm always a big believer in your best gear is whatever you have in your hands. If that's your phone, if that's your paintbrush, you know, whatever it is, um, then at a certain point, for me, the choice became, I want to bump my, my vision up a level to this certain level, plus I'm a professional and I've you know, kind of held to a different set of standards. So I needed a GFX to go to the level I wanted to. Do I still take pictures with my iPhone and are they amazing? Yeah. Well, they're sometimes amazing, <laughs> depending on if I do it right or not. But yeah, I do. But for the upper level work that I do, the GFX is a, is a huge tool for that. What's so great about the GFX, I'll be talking more about that. And what about storage? Well, if it's between the 50S and the 100S, naturally the 50S images take up less storage. The 100S, you know, becomes another storage issue, which 
you can overcome in part by becoming a better, more selective artist, you know, and take fewer pictures, be, you know, uh, more up, upright about deleting as you go, so on and so forth. But these are some of the considerations like between the cameras um, that I have had to answer for myself and that I get asked. And then generally speaking about GFX. So I just kind of wanted to touch on some of those, but the part two, and this is where decisions are made. And, and this, I always say, my mother used to ra you know, raised me this way that you choose the right tool for the job, whatever that job is, but that job is what you decide that it's gonna be. So you have to consider your vision and what that is and what will help you create that the best and your dreams you know, where you want to go. I always knew when I started photography, it was in film. And so I always knew that I wanted to do prints because that was always the goal. So prints were always part of the picture. So the tools that make it easier to do prints and for whatever reason, mine seemed to get printed big, whatever tools are going to make that easier for me, I'm going to go there. So, you know, that's that. That's me. So now that now you're learning about me and my choices, and hopefully this leads a, a leaves a, a breadcrumb trail to you and your choices. So here are my some of also knowing your why, you know, why you're doing a thing, uh, what it is you want to convey, but also the, you know, like I just said, are you going to do large prints? Are you doing commercial? Are you doing macro? Are you doing, you know, what, what, what is your end? What's your end game? What's the result you're going for? And then work backwards. That's always a good, a good plan. So mine had to do with personal work and the, specifically in my personal work, it had to do with the feels. Now the feels, as I mentioned before, are kind of a quantum element that some people have a hard time wrapping their head around. I used to get laughed at and you know, people would say, oh, she's a good photographer, but she's a little woo woo uh, because I would talk about, you know, what do you love? What do you feel? I talk about what you feel. But the reason is now we have better explanations because of all the quantum physics and information that's come out there. It's quantum. It's, you know, there is a, a, a part of physics that can explain why this is so important and why for me, the choice of GFX has to do with the kind of detail and the kind of planner separation and the, and the amount of data about the fields I can get laid down on the sensor. I wanted to do big prints. I wanted portability. Like I wanted to shoot large format all my life, but it was so huge <laughs> I couldn't, and it was so clunky and slow that I couldn't take it places and do what it was I wanted to do. Cause I could, I could have done it, you know, and stood up in a, you know, been totally limited by what I could do. But now this is a really portable system that I can actually bring to my vision. Um, I wanted to film it quality because as I said, I started in film and I love that um, element. And I'm, a, I'm an analog girl all the way around. I do voiceovers professionally and I don't like a really super clean, soulless digital sound in my voice. I like um, what we call a little bit of hair <laughs> on the sound because it needs to have some air in it and some breath in it and uh and some character in it that is of its own quality the, the sort of the celluloid feel and of course gfx has that all over it um, i needed low noise at high iso which i have it, with with gfx it's phenomenal one of the details and the colors of course um, why is that important because in storytelling and it, which my story has a lot to do with feels the story has to be told in the details. God is in the details, right? So storytelling requires a tremendous amount of data and details that are just there. And we'll talk more about that. Computing and storage, you know, um, were a factor, <clears throat> especially with the 50S. Since today I'm talking about the 50S. Now the 100S changed the game a little bit for me, but the, the 50S because I wanted to take it on the road, because I wasn't going to have my biggest, beefiest you know, computer with me, I, I was leaning on the 50S because the computing power didn't need to be quite as strong and the storage wasn't quite as much of a concern. I like to create work. Now, I, this last thing, oxygen for your walls. 
this is this is sort of the blue sky part of what I do. When I create my art, when I do the work that I do, that I sell, that I, and it isn't just a commodity to me, it is really like a sharing of light and a vision and of uplifting, wonderful feelings. It's a spiritual thing for me. I think of my work then, since it's quantumly embedded <laughs> with all those feelings as oxygen for your walls. It's not just decor, although it is that, and it can be that, and that's not a problem, but that's sort of the low hanging fruit. The part I want to be able to embed in my work is the feeling of oxygen for your walls. So that when you look at that piece, it's like, oh, I feel like I can breathe better now. So, you know, we all have dreams. Those are some of mine. I told you, you'd know me a little bit better by the end. So here we go. So basically what I'm talking about is telling my story my way. So here's how I'm going to do it. Now, because we're, we're talking about gear in service of vision, I just want to make that assertion. We are talking about gear. It's just I promised you that we would talk about it in a different way, about how gear can be of service to your vision. So it helps to know a little bit about the characteristics of the lens, which is the eye. So the camera is like the brain, and then the lens is like your eye. So in considering lenses to go with the brain, um, the eye to stick in the brain, the, <laughs> which should be blunt, um, let's talk about different lenses. So I kind of divided this down into lenses so that I could talk about the decisions and the whys within the con construct of that. So wider view lenses, wide effect lenses, which can cover you know, a range from, I don't know, let's say maybe 24 to, you know, and lower, like pretty wide. Um, and then, you know, Lewis can always talk about the conversion to full frame equivalent, but anyway, wide effect. We're just talking about wide effect, whether they're zoom or whether they're prime. More is in the frame, obviously. More is in focus. It's just how they're designed. You just natively have more in focus in a wide angle lens. You have possible distortion, which can be a bad or a good thing. Um, you know, if you're an architecture, architectural photographer and you want everything straight, that may not be a good thing. And there may be other things you got to do to make sure your lines are straight. But if you're an expressive person and you want to add expression and interesting um, I don't want to say effects, but you know, you want to go go a little further then wide angle lenses and their distortion are a good thing. So it's just really how you use it. The images will feel, taking it back to feel, they tend to feel a little more epic, sweeping. I always have epic in there twice. I was going to take it out, but it always cracks me up to have it in there twice because epic is so big, but it's a small word. So maybe you should have the word in there twice. Welcome to my mind. Grand, trippy, and sometimes surreal. So we're going to talk first about the 23 Milli, uh, uh, millimeter 23 lewis can you jump in here and tell me what it can what it, it, the full frame equivalent is of 23 so the magic number you have to take 0.79 or if you want to make it easy 0 0.80 um, so your 23 is effective it's like your 18 if you're looking at a 35 frame um, full frame full frame yeah yeah so just take 0.79 that will get you the magic number from our lenses and you're multiplying not dividing correct so that's correct yeah that's correct. okay so there you go. All right. So this is wider. This is so far. Do we have a wider lens for the GFX at this point, Lewis? Uh, as of last September, we did announce, Tokyo announced a Zoom. It's going to be a 20 to 35. So that's going to be like a 16 to 28. There you go. So this is a 23. It's a prime. So it has, you know, ultra sharpness and all this kind of thing, which I will demonstrate in, in one. But the wider ones, you know, they get a little more in there. Here, I, here was this little stream. Now, when you get down low in these little streams that don't look like much when you're standing over them, suddenly they have a whole new life. I love fall and I love this particular stream near where I live at a certain time because winter and fall happen in the same frame and the, the, uh, the ice formations are just so trippy. So... I love the story that this tells of transition and two seasons and, um, you know, you get the idea of motion and movement and the ephemeral nature of life. Because for me, everything has to do with how I feel about life, how I feel about, um, you know, everything in it. 
which is sometimes really hard to put into words. I love journeys. I love light that filters through trees. These are aspens in Utah. And, uh, and a path. I can't resist a path and a journey. So keep in mind, this is, I'm going to throw some tips in here. A couple things. One, I also use aspect ratios in all of the GFXs a lot. This, this particular aspect ratio is the, it's, oh God, it's 24 by 65. Lewis, am I right about that? It's the long skinny one. What was your, sorry? What was your question, Carol? Was the question typing. is the aspect ratio is the really long skinny one is 24 by 65? It is, I believe so. So it reminds me our film camera 617. Yeah. You know, and so yes, uh, you're correct. Yeah. yeah, 617, thanks. So I love this. And, and I think as an artist, it really is helpful to use these um, aspect ratios because it, it makes your brain work a little differently. It makes you compose differently. Yes, you can crop it later and, and you may. Um, but when you throw on the aspect ratio, suddenly it, it just makes your eye focus art, real art, and everything is in the specifics and in the details. And these aspect ratios really help you uh, do that. This one happens to be the um, nine, by, you know, the 16 by nine and um, aspect ratio, <clears throat> because what I wanted to emphasize was the, and I made it distort just a little bit so that the uh, shadows would stretch and the road would look a little more exaggerated where it forked right here in the fall. This is in the Eastern Sierras. Same thing here, but this time it was the four by five um, aspect ratio because the stretch or the distortion I wanted was top to bottom, whereas this was left to right. So this is why I say it's really helpful. Yes, you can tilt your camera and you can see the, um, you can see where it goes, but it makes you frame your image very carefully and very thoughtfully if you actually use the aspect ratio that emphasizes the vision the most. And again, fall in the Eastern Sierras. Boy, is that one of my places, favorite places to be. So then on the left, don't forget your vertical, you know, your vertical orientation with a wide angle because you can make it really stretchy and really cool and in interesting distortion um, vertically as well. So on the left, this is in France on um, St. Honora Island, which is off the coast of Cannes in the French Riviera, which is one of the places I used to, uh, that I've taken my um, artist voice photography retreats. And uh, this was during one of those, one of those events um, at the old fortress on the island. <clears throat> oh, it's fabulous. I'm sorry, I just took a vacation there for a second. <laughs> and on the right again is, is Bishop. <clears throat> or outside of Bishop in the Eastern Sierras. And so a wide angle on a big curvy Aspen tree will exaggerate it a little bit and create even more of an effect if you're a storyteller, if that's what you like to do, which I do. I love stories. So another thing about wide angle and gear itself is maximize what it can do. A lot of people don't think about a wide angle lens doing something in a macro sense. But why not? Because natively, especially if you want a lot in focus, because natively a wide angle lens has more in focus. So if you take it up close and personal and make it act like a macro, you're not going to have to work so hard. You may not even have to focus stack to get a nice in focus image. Now, macro, I'm not a, you'll, we'll talk about macro later. Anyway, so this is another way to use um, the fantastic qualities of a wider angle lens and its ability to focus on a lot of things in the same frame. And, but this was really up close and I had to get right down in it, um, which is really fun to do. <clears throat> All right, mid-range mid lenses then are more of your personal view. Like you're, it's like a slice of life. It's like about the width of your natural peripheral vision. Um, and of course with mid-range lenses, you have, you know, you can use your depth of field more shallow or, or deeper, you know, to taste and to the story that you're telling and what you want to emphasize. These images feel personal. They feel inviting. They feel special because they were chosen because you have to think a little bit more about your composition and what makes it personal. And in this case, I'm using the 32 to 64 and 
this is a big scopey epic. You would think of it as a wide angle shot, but see, this is where it, this is where it kind of messes with your mind a little bit because wide isn't necessarily wide angle. Wide can be a scopier mid range about your peripheral vision, which this was. This is in Zion National Park. It's part of a project. It's actually my part of it's coming out March 4th. I'm very excited about it. And, um, and this really is about the, the peripheral vision that I saw from the Canyon Overlook there in Zion. So super epic, super landscapey, su super natural. <laughs> I just love it. And then using my um, 24, you know, the more exact, the 24 by 65 aspect ratio, Lake Tahoe after a snow, um, I just wanted Sand Harbor. I just wanted this slice because it said everything, anything more. And it took away from the story of these, they're super epic, but they're also super iconic stones with the snow on top and slowing the water down and just the stormy day. I just thought it was a stunning, stunning point of view of one of my favorite places right where I live. Traveling, back to travel. On the left is Antibes in the French Riviera and on the right is Grasse, which is just a, is still in the French Riviera, but it's up in the, in the hills. <clears throat> and so I'm also, you notice I'm putting the lenses, I'm putting my settings. I'm, I don't normally talk about settings and all that kind of thing, but I wanted you to see, like for instance, on the left, ISO 1000 and there's still no noise because I wanted to handhold it. And, you know, you get in some of these alleys and they're a little bit darker and, um, you know, you kind of have to learn what shutter speed you can hold still, even though, you know, Lewis, remind me, the 32 to 64 does not have image stabilization. Mm, I believe not. Uh, right. I think our the only one it does have on prime lens is our 120. Yep. Then our 100, 200, and our 250. Right. So when I carry the 32 to 64, I crank up the ISO in darker areas, but it doesn't matter. I used to worry about it because there used to be noise used to be such an issue back in the day uh, with other cameras, um, but I don't have that problem here. So I just crank it up and have a nice, have a nice day. Um, I did not use a tripod on the left, hence the ISO being high. And on the right, I did because it was obviously at night. And it was a 10 second <laughs> exposure, um, but the detail and the vibe and the, I also use film simulations to give me ideas. I like to post-process the raw, but I often use the film simulations to give me some inspiration because they're so good, because they're filmic, because that's Fujifilm's background. Um, and that's another reason why, you know, I like the system for specifically what I like to create. And just another one in grass, the detail and the texture and the light. And I used to have to shoot uh, a lot of HDR just to just to get be able to capture all the whole dynamic range. But I don't have to do that anymore with this system. So this was one shot. Um, and yes, I post process. Was that Photoshop? Yes, I Photoshop. <laughs> I do a lot of stuff. Um, but <laughs> so, yes, I just want to head that one off at the past. But number two to that answer is that I also in camera use film simulations, but I also use the settings, the color settings and the tones and the highlights and the shadows. And I do a lot of those adjustments in the camera since I do love to post process, but by making those kinds of adjustments in the camera, the, the photo comes out a lot closer. So I don't have to work quite as hard and I can get the job done a little bit quicker, which is super helpful. Um, you know, Oh gosh, you know, the family of trees, me and trees and snow, I, I go out of my mind finding little stories. Cause to me, this is like the sheltering family, the youngins, you know, under the branches of the old, the elders and the snow coming down. And um, I was actually he heading out on my, in snowshoes and it was a full on snow day. Um, and I was just, I just had my camera, it was on my tripod, but I, I just held it as a monopod. So it wasn't totally steady. But at, at 125th of a second on this um, cold day, it was totally in focus, super awesome. So here's where, so you see ISO 1600 um, and the noise is not an issue. If 
there is noise. Sometimes I actually like the noise at really high ISO. There is a little bit, but I like it because it's like the noise that was in film, which I still like. I'm not, again, I'm not a, uh, one of these digital, everything has to be super clean with no, nothing in it. Ugh, ugh, ah, just makes my, my throat tighten up. So I actually like character. It's all part of the character, but even at 1600, you know, there really isn't noise in this, uh, in this image. So Death Valley, the light and the way it spills and pours and creating these little compositions of light in the late afternoon and watching how the light bounces and dances and these formations and the stories and the, the architecture of up close and personal. This is not macro. This is still the 32 to 64. So again, using your lens to, to, to fulfill your vision without, because you can't change lenses out in Death Valley or else you'll ruin your camera or your lens. Lewis <laughs> has seen me do that once or twice. Uh, making the mistakes I tell others not to do, which is how I'm reminded that I'm human too. Anyways, uh, yeah, you got to keep one lens on, which is why when I go in these kinds of environments, I always take the 32 to 64 because I do have a zoom range and I ain't changing lenses because I'm not ruining my camera and my sensor. So um, I find in, in Mesquite Dunes, I'm really attracted to all of this kind of thing. And if you find yourself loving like you get fascinated and obsessed with, oh my God, I love, well, in this case, I love these um, formations in the sand and the evidence of wind and the evidence of something you can't see that has a, an effect on the matter and the material. I mean, it, I don't know. It's just, it gets all magical and woo-woo for me. So I photograph it and I can photograph my love of it and the little creature on the upper right. Um, they turn into little studies of the way that you see and the way that you feel and the specifics of the world around you that moves you. That's how we get to know you. So what you're learning about me is I love detail. I love behind the scenes. I love why I love, oh, I don't, you know, that's, that's the obvious, but look behind it. You know, what's behind the curtain. That's part of my character. And that's how it comes across in my work um, in detail. So just going to kind of move through some of these uh, images. And the, the right is in grass. It's a 12th century stone church. And I was fascinated by the way the light came in through these windows. I just was in the, all the angles and it was just kind of blew my mind. So I made a little study of it, took a bunch of photos. This is one of them. And then on the left is in Utah. That's a slide. That's a kid's slide. It's from, you know, another era, but they made them out of this uh, a sandstone. So they carved it by going down it over and over and over again on that little wood thing, which has a, like a, a section that goes down into the sandstone and, and creates that crevice. Again, 32 to 64, epic skies. And still talking series on the bottom right is, well, series, okay. I'm gonna show you a series that is in part in one place but is in part a way of thinking, right? So here we are on the left, big open skies. I just love these kind of cloud formations and the desolate, you know, this is on the way to Utah. I, think, I don't know if it's in Nevada or Utah at this point, but the skies, oh my goodness. So that was the story. But <clears throat> in a similar kind of landscape, I also love the story, you know, the three trees, the three sisters, the three, three, it's pattern. We're hardwired to love patterns, humans. Think of our DNA, it's a pattern. So we love patterns, we're attracted to them and nature is full of them and they are the building blocks of everything. So another part of the series in the same area as these trees is the big sweeping fields, uh, barley fields, which flip me out, especially when there's these clouds that float over them and the light changes and I love it. And black and white just told the story for me. So again, fall in love with patterns. And, you know, this is still a series. This is in a, in a slot Canyon, a, an unknown slot Canyon in Utah in Escalante and all the little stories. It's like the womb of the earth to me. And it came alive. As soon as I thought of that, all of a sudden, all of these little stories began to pop out and they were like movie moments. Every one of them. Ditto the Mormon, you know, the Mormon, uh, going blank in um, Wyoming, Grand Tetons, 
Mormon Row, thank you very much. So the Tetons on the left and this old barn. So one of the things I love, barns, I grew up on a ranch, old barns just make me nuts. So this barn leaning, it just felt very Ansel Adamsy to me. So of course it had to be black and white. And of course it had to be, you know, the Fujifilm sensibilities. And, um, and again, the 16 by nine ratio just made it all, all the more kind of exaggerated Lake Tahoe. So here's another thing about series, about studies, about letting yourself go down rabbit holes um, through your artistic paintbrush, which is a camera, in this case, the GFX 50S, um, is this, I won't describe the whole day, we don't have time to go into the whole story, but this is at Lake Tahoe in an epic snow where um, I stepped off the edge and went up to my waist <laughs> with snowshoes on. That's how deep the snow was. And after I crawled out, I looked back and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a storybook. I, the word storybook went into my mind and I took this picture and I loved it. But what I saw in my mind was this. So let yourself go down rabbit holes. Let you, you know, talk to your gear and your camera. What do I see? What is this? Follow your whims. Let your muse speak. Don't be all perfect and technical all the time, but let your, you know, in the case, one of the things I love about Fujifilm and the GFX is, is the way it encourages me to dream and think and how it helps me actually gives me ideas. And I can talk more about that later. Telephoto and macro. The telephoto effect, you have less in the frame which focuses attention. You also have more compression, which is a, a compression of distance. So it, like far away, doesn't look as far away, which is this kind of weird effect that you don't think about it, but your brain notices details. And then the ability, a depth of field to have great bokeh and all this kind of thing. These images feel intimate, delicate, detailed, dreamy, up close and very personal. So, this isn't wanting to change. So what just happened? Here we go. The 100 to 200. I'm just going to whip through some of these. Again, personal. This is near where I live in uh, Truckee, California. And it's personal all the more so because of the chair. It was the chair. I mean, this is a scene that I see a lot and that I love. But the second the chair was there on this icy, icy cold day, all of a sudden it was another world to me and had to take a picture of it. So there you go. And then... This being a bigger story. So telephotos, you know, you can pull in things at a distance, but you can also use a personal range, personal framing, or bring it in. So like this is the full chorus, the full choir. This is like three voices out of the choir. So I like to chunk in and get like pieces of the whole that still tell the whole story. And I like to do that with any lens that I um, use. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also a way to have more stories, to have a bigger book, to have a more varietal wine, if you want to think of it that way. Detail. I mean, this is just what a story. This tree is alive. How? I don't know. Growing on rock and half of it's hanging over the rock. The earth has been washed away, but just the detail. And it felt really vintage uh, of another era. And the details of the GFX for me made this a viable image instead of just a mess because of, I don't know, it's very poignant to me. So there's a character that medium format does with the planner separation, the separation of planes that large format offers that enables you to tell a story differently because you can separate. It's almost like 3D, but it's not 3D, but it's, it's if you think along those lines, that's what makes certain kinds of, of shots with uh, large format um, a little different than other kinds of cameras. This, I call this a DNA shot because it's at the Alabama Hills, which is this, uh, I have another picture of a little bit the larger for, uh, rock formations, but this is just the brush stroke, the DNA, the pattern, the, the thing, the one piece that the rest is made up of that is still recognizable. And to me, it's all the more poignant because of the way the light is bouncing off the rims of the rocks, Lake Tahoe. So this is all with a hundred to 200. And I just have a tendency to make little stories everywhere I go. That's part of who I am. These are teeth, <laughs> ice teeth. 
and again, seems kind of macro-ish, but I, before I ever owned a macro lens, I used to use my telephoto lenses for my macro shots. Pulling in distance up close, the light spilling down the mountain. This is in Truckee, California. Creating the shadows and the gentle caress of the light over the, over the landscape. It just took my breath away. And then the detail of up here where the snow had poured, you know, had snowball, something had cut loose and cut across the snow. You can see it in every detail. And if you see the image and you zoom it in 100%, every detail is there. It's insane. And then this is part of the Alabama Hills as well. We talk about telephoto and the 250. This was a shot it took me five years to get. It's down in Mammoth Lakes. And this, this little building is so freaking cool. But it, in this field and at a certain time of day, what the light does, the way it spills across the landscape. But I knew there were sheep. And, you know, I thought, well, this is a cool building and I like the light and I like all the different colors and I, you know, my ranching background, I just, I loved it all, but I, the sheep were never there until this one day I drove by and I slammed on my brakes and I got the shot I'd been waiting for it. And I didn't even see the two crows on the building until I got it on my computer, but finally I got the shot. Ah. Oh. It was a good day. And that I got it with a GFX was fantastic because you can see every one of those little sheepsies up close and personal when you zoom in. Mount Whitney. This 250 lens is phenomenal. It's so sharp, but it's at a, it's at a, it almost kicked my butt because it's at, it's in a focal range that I don't normally dwell on, but I had an assignment with it. And I was really annoyed for a while because I'm like, it was, I just couldn't see what the point of it was in landscape until I got what it saw. I, it took me a week to grok what it was trying to tell me about the world that I live in. And I realized I never stopped to look at this. This is a slice of life and a distance I never look at. How weird is that? So then once I got that, all of a sudden I couldn't stop seeing everything through this lens because I had never seen I never stopped at 250. I always go further or less. So it was a real, it was a revelation as an artist. It really unlocked my mind in many ways. And the moon up there in the left was just there. I didn't do anything to that. It was just there. And the detail and the way, and the way it handled the light and everything just blew my mind. This is the Alabama Hills also. So, you know, again, roads and journeys and movement and sweeping gestures. I was a figure skater, I was a dancer. Sweeping gestures and movement are just so close to my heart. The mystical pelicans behind our house descend for like two weeks in July every year. And they were just like, the visitation just always blew my mind. So I'd always run out with my, <laughs> my lens and sit on the edge of the pond and photograph them. And they'd give me the stink eye because they don't really like people that much and they you're like what are you doing what are you pointing at that thing at me for just, just they're such a huge part of my life in Truckee that uh, to be able to capture them this way with this camera made my feeling about these creatures who visited us every year and all the things that happened um so real so visceral and that's the thing about stories is they're visceral and they mean something and you've got to commit to them and you've got to go the distance and not go, not pull back at the last minute and go, oh, I don't know if I should commit. I don't know if I should go that far. Oh, what if it's to this or to that? You can't do that. You got to go for it. This isn't perfect. And I like the fact that it isn't perfect because it's very filmic in the imperfection of it. It's, it's a weird, it's a weird image for me, but I love it. I'm just going to scroll through some of these. You can begin to sort of let your, let the ideas and the feelings of it sort of roll over the buds of your mind. Brush strokes. I love brush strokes. I love not knowing the whole story. I like my imagination to be able to wander. So this was that for me. This is using a telephoto, the 250 as a macro lens because I could. <laughs> And telling stories of the bristlecone pines in, in the bristlecone national bristlecone uh, uh, ancient bristlecone pine forest down in Bishop California, which is a um, I believe a national park or a national monument. I forget which. But it's anyway, located in the White Mountains. 
Yeah, in the White Mountains, it's just phenomenal. So the little stories are the ones that, I mean, sort of the anguish in this tells this story of time about these bristlecone pines in a in a macro fashion with a telephoto lens that I just found irresistible. And finally, I'm going to end with the 120 macro, which I've basically had glued to my face for the last year for one reason and another, but um, it falls in the telephoto range. Now, this one does have stabilization, so I've pushed this one a lot, um, and it's amazing. The stabilization is incredible. So I love this because you don't notice the B right away, um, it, which is right here, and you can see it's a little shadow. So I mean the detail and the depth and the stabilization. I'm kind of a, a macro freak. And the other thing too is, you know, with with COVID and get, getting stuck at home and being cut off, you throw on a macro lens and go reimagine your world. This is just uh, an echinacea growing in my yard that I planted. And it's one of my favorite photos. I'm, I'm obsessed with this photo um, because of the way it feels. Fall. This is how I shot fall one year, a couple of years ago. I shot fall with a macro lens, the whole thing, because of the story of transition and movement and time that I could see in a completely different way through a telephoto lens, which I love because I love why. I love detail. I want to know what's behind the curtain. I love the feeling here of the movement and the holding on until the last possible second because I'm one of those people that will do that. It's poignant. It's and not to forget that a macro lens is also a great, at least this one is, is also a great landscape lens. Let's not forget, oops, sorry, hit the thing. But in juxtaposition, you can tell a really scopey story with a macro lens because it does this and this all in the same shoot. So why not? That's what I like to do. How far can I stretch it? What else can I do? Can I shoot my uh, cutlery drawer, my spoons and my forks that are not expensive or fancy in a way that is artistic? Can I shoot the canister, the stainless steel canister and make it art with a macro lens? What story does that tell? See, I love asking myself those questions and then going and, and exploring because I explore life uh, that way and myself and quantum. And you know that's why I come up with all this stuff because that's just how I am. This is ISO 4000 and I really didn't do anything to it. I don't think I did a little, I might've done a little bit of color enhancement. And now we're getting to the setting sun. It's an impression. This is an impression. I was sitting in my backyard at sunset, having a little glass of wine. And I saw this and I was like, oh my God. And see that feeling is how I take pictures. If I get that response, it's, then I got to take that picture. So there you go. That was that picture. There's a little tree in my backyard that I just put me in a sense of awe, which is transformational of itself. And the same here. So basically what we have the opportunity to do is we each have a spark of divine fire in us. And what being able to paint with light and time allows us to do is share that spark of divine fire and give it to someone else to maybe illuminate the way for them to spark them into something more and to share it that way. And I am telling you, you have no idea how far that can go. So if my computer will just be good enough, that's me and that's my message. And I see there's a bunch of questions and uh, I would love to answer them. So I'm going to stop screen sharing right now. So I hope that now I want to look and see what are some of the questions. Do I purposely shoot black and white film simulations or do I convert later? I do both. I do a um, I do shoot black and white film simulations because sometimes I want to get a sense of whether it'll be a good you know whether I've chosen wisely and it'll be a good black and white image and also to get some ideas about how I might want to process it. I have a black and white sensibility, because that's how I started in photography and I used to develop black and white. And so consequently, I like, to, I like to do my own editing for black and white, but I do, I do bring the simulations in and look at them, get ideas from it, use it for inspiration. 
Okay, what other? Yes, I did do a Procreate class last year for Kelby One. Yeah, that was fun. Also, do I have a processing class? I'm going to include processing in the upcoming online. Uh, uh, I'm still deciding whether I'm calling it a course or a retreat or trying to find a good, cool word that is what it is. But I'll be, we'll be doing processing in that. Sorry, I interrupted. Oh, I was, I was just, I don't, don't know if Lewis was going to cover the Q and A panel, but there's also the Q. &A. I, I could. Um, I just didn't want her to miss those questions because sure. she's looking at. Yeah, them. if you could feed me the questions, that would be super awesome because I couldn't see them coming in. Um, you know, the first one from Russell Moore. He has a long question. Um, let's see. Uh, let's it. Um, I'm trying to make it short because. He's trying to transition to digital from film for, I guess he's been doing film for 40 years. Um, he's done super graphic uh, Mamiya, Canon, and currently upgrade to 1D. He's looking at the GFX 50. Thank you so much on this video. So I guess he's on that uh, border, um, making his mind, because maybe he's not getting what he's what he's looking on previous formats and it's what he wants. He wants to create what he's done in, on large formats on film cameras. Well, you know, if he sh has shot the Canon 1D, then he might, what you might do is get your hands on a GFX, take a picture and look at them side by side. Um, to me, they're different, but you know, it's like in my audio world, not everybody has the same set of ears. You don't necessarily hear the same frequencies or hear things the same way you tune your ear. So, you know, um, I think that might be a, a way to go there. I did that when I was switching from my previous platform to Fujifilm. I put a lot of them up side by side to, you know, see what the what. And um, also, I'd like to let Russell know we're doing uh, free rentals across the board. And Kenmore is one of the stores that are doing free rentals on the GFX 50S with the 35 to 70 lens. But, but if you're not here in the West, there is uh, on our website showing what stores across the country are doing these uh, free rentals if he wants to do that yeah. for two days. Yeah. That might be a great way to do it. That's what uh, I would do, especially if you have a lot of experience in a, in a particular set of sensibilities already, um, you know, you can see for yourself. The other question is, um, I kind of know your answer. What, uh, what camera specially, uh, what camera specially you're actually using? I know you start with the 50S and now you have the 100S. Um, I know you use both, but I think you're using the 100S currently more than your 50S. Yeah, we had I that mean, discussion. The, yeah, because the, here's the thing is I had the um, X series for a really long time and it takes a long time to build your portfolio and your library and of experiences and life and so on and so forth. So I had a lot of years with the X series, which of course I loved. Um, and so the GFX only came into my life in recent, like, mm, well, I beta tested the 50S when it first came out in 2017, but I didn't own it. Um, so I would, you know, use it for different projects and then send it back. So I got my own, I think in 2019 or 2019, maybe. So, it, you know, it takes a while to build a portfolio. So I've been shooting a lot with the GFX because I'm trying to build my portfolio and it takes a number of years and going places and things like this. And that has been a little challenging to say the least. So right now, because of the projects I'm doing, my primary camera is the 100S. And then I use my 50S as my backup because I have them both. Um, you know, if I'm going somewhere that I know I have to use like 100 to 400, I'll take my X, my X-T3. Or if I'm backpacking somewhere that, you know, I need to take, it just depends on the situation. But for the most part, I use the GFX purposely because I'm trying to develop my, my portfolio with that system because of the big print thing, largely. Does that makes sense, it, I hope. No, it does, it yep. does. Um, Alexandra is asking, all your images are really super clear. Um, how often do you focus stack and how many images do you stack on average? And you never focus stack. Oh, I was gonna say, I don't think after we discussed, we talked a lot, I don't think you ever focus stack. That option's in our cameras, um, but I don't remember you stacking. Uh -uh. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, that's, uh, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, focus stacking is in the camera. Um, so I, I, I'm not making any hard and fast rules, but I tend to 
love being out and the whole experience and the organic and the getting in the zone and everything and doing too much technically, not that I can't, it's that I don't like to <laughs> because it takes away from my experience. I want my gear to work in service of me. I don't want to work in service of it. I don't do focus stacking because I don't, it, that I have to do on the computer just because I don't want to spend more time in front of the computer because I already have to spend too much time in front of the computer. So these come down to lifestyle choices and desires of how you want to think and see. Plus my photographic sensibilities enjoy um, imperfections. And when I say imperfections, I more specifically like images that look at things the way my eye does. So to me, focus stacking is kind of a heightened thing and it's really cool. I love looking at people's. I just don't want to do it myself because it's not part of how I enjoy experiencing life. I don't necessarily want to see all the detail. It's too much for me in life. In an image where it's controlled, that's okay. But as an expression of who I am, I don't, I don't do it. So I have a question from Charles, or Charles has a question. Uh, JPEG or RAW? Both. Both, yeah. I had a feeling you were gonna say that. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I do the same. Yeah. Um, are you using ND filters for these longer water exposures? Yes, yes I do, unless I'm shooting them late. And you know, unless it just happens that there's, you know, the light is such that, and the, and the uh, shutter speed is such that I get the effect I want without it. Otherwise I use, Filters and I use LaCroix. I love LaCroix filters above all. And I think you already answered your post process for Lake Tahoe looked like a painting. Like uh, you're using Procrate or? Um, and the gentleman, uh, Harvey, says, I'm looking forward to complete my travel kit. Yep. The travel um, kit, the complete travel kit is good. Well, I, the first time I took my GFX to France, I, I'm trying to think, I think I took my, well, definitely took the 32 to 64 and I might've taken the 23 and that's it. It's two lenses and that camera. And then Clive has a question I, I can answer. What's the difference between the 50S2 and the 50R? Mm -hmm. uh, 50R is more style as a rangefinder. 50S2, that's our newest. Uh, on that same sensor uh, improves processor um, than the 50R, you have uh, your stabilization. You have about uh, five and a half stops of stabilization in the body. You have the newer battery um, screen. It's very similar. Um, otherwise, um, you got some new features, new menus of uh, film simulations. So there's a lot of things that are new, but we designed those two bodies when it's like a range fighter again. Another one has a very all purpose. 50S2, it's all purpose with stabilization. 50S2 is a little more like the 100S, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. We're using the same body. Um, so you're going to get the same uh, control. I love the 100S. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's this small and it's this light? <laughs> like, you're kidding. Kind of blows And then uh, somebody says, when the 23, one force is coming out, uh, I say soon. I think it's. Uh, Coming out next next week, the twenty fourth. Twenty three one two. Yeah, the twenty three for the XF lineup. XF lineup. Uh, the new oh, twenty three yeah, for the XF yeah. is on the twenty fourth, and it has not changed, so it's going to be on the twenty fourth. I have that lens. That, you're talking about the X X series. Yes, right? yes. I have that lens. I and we have it here showing it. It's genius. That is such a great lens. Uh, Matt. Uh, questions but your work he loves your work phenomenal loves the images um i don't know if that's a question but uh, <laughs> i think that was my that was your last question on uh, q a yeah so you know i was just thinking that in, in thank you very much those of you who are gushing about my images i really appreciate it i will say that the one thing that you know when when you do this thing about bringing your voice and bringing yourself to your images what it al allows you to do is say things and express things you'd be too embarrassed to say in person. Frank, that's me. <laughs> so like I have this like, you know, poetic brush strokey Isadora Duncan kind of way of feeling and gushing about the world that I learned early on that if I say it too much, people start to not wanna hear it and they laugh at me and, and I feel stupid. So I put it in my images. 
and then people like that because you know it's it's part of your soul speaking and it is really um pure and it's really like to the heart and um yeah and it, and it, so that's why as artists it's important for us to do this and show up this way because these things need to be expressed and created and brought manifested into the world where people can feel it um because a lot of times we're not allowed to say it for one reason or another and we do want to move other people in this way and i'm hoping that by my doing it and pointing at it <laughs> um it inspires you to do the same whether it's in photography or whatever you know whatever the, the medium is um but you know and this is going to be what my course is going to be going into as well and like I say, news of that will appear on karenhutton.com. And of course, I'll be posting about it too. This is not, not quite to the public point yet, but we're getting there. It'll be there soon. And I had somebody ask uh, about the free loaner. You can find it uh, at fujifilm-x.com. And if you're here in, the, here in the North Pacific, you can actually go to Kenmore's website and they have that information there, or you could just come to the store. But if somebody's throughout the U.S., feel free to go to our website. All our information on that website, fujifilm-.com has a lot of information, plus Cameron's um, bio. Uh, we actually put events there, our um, firmware updates, software, everything it's in there, including free classes, things like that. Well, Karen, thank you very much. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, hopefully I could see you soon in person. Uh, I know a couple of times we wanted to meet up, but uh, I know. Well, we're going to because we have a little project we're going to do. Yes, yes. Elbow, elbow. By the yes. way, I see a question. Clive Graw, I think I'm saying that right. Do you have photo trips? I did uh, before COVID and I'm going to wait till the world settles down. So uh, just because I just don't want to deal with it and worry about people's health and safety and liability. That's just my personal choice. Uh, so instead, that's why I'm creating my my online course to bring all the goodness there. and. Um, it's going to be going to be pretty rocking. So there you go. Thank you. Thanks. I was trying to quickly get in there and find the link on our site to put in there for the GFX uh, rental, but I ran out of time, but um, it should be one of our banners. If you look at our, our top banner, there should be, it should be in there, but um, thank you, Karen, as you. always, it's always a pleasure to have you on Ditto. here. You're, I love doing these with we you We had a wonderful best. chat window going, which is really fun because, you know, your personality just leads to that. So it's, it's really wonderful. And usually everybody's very quiet, but everybody was. Yay. That we should like to have a whole separate like chat room yeah. after and sit around and chat for another half yeah. hour. Yeah. Kind of feels like, you know, we're all just hanging out together and yeah. talking about photography and looking at some beautiful images, but yeah, um, that's so, so thank that's you. It's about. a pleasure having you back. And thank you. Hopefully we will cross paths again. Yes. And Lewis, thank you for, thank you for having me the back and coming in. And he's, he's back in our, in one of our classrooms right now, doing a zoom from here so he can run back he out is. and be on the counter. Yes. yes I me. know. I know him and Jeff are a great team. We love having oh my gosh. Them in the store. Yeah. So. Sometimes we get in trouble, but that's okay. That's the fun part. Sometimes oh, you can't get in trouble here. How about like every time you're together and now Jeff, now Jeff has Gary, uh, uh, Jerry Garcia hair. So yes, it's a rock I, bad I, look. Yeah. You need to do, you need to do some selfies and then send them to me like well. today. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> You're the okay, dream. guys. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you, see. everybody, for joining. Thanks, everybody. Us. Yeah, thank you. And bye -bye. we'll put this up on our YouTube eventually after we have the sale to deal with. And we're kind of shorthanded because everybody's busy. But when it renders and gets down, maybe in the next day or two, and I'll get that over to you too, Karen. So thank you. I really appreciate sure. it. I'll share that All right. far and wide. So thank yeah. you. And thanks, guys. All right. Bye, everybody. Guys, have a great weekend.